uses music. I grew up in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. I grew up in a time when Elvis Presley was a big singer. The Beatles were coming out of England, coming on to the Ed Sullivan Show, and America fell apart. <laughs> Johnny Cash was singing down in the South, songs of gospel, but also country western. So at about the age of uh, 16, I got a hold of an old guitar and I started to play uh, Walk the Line. I guess I had some aspirations of being Johnny Cash or something like him. I used to listen to WLS out of Chicago, it became my station as a young boy, young man. But in 1966, all that changed. I met Jesus Christ, and my life has been different ever since. In the 1970s and the 1980s, I learned to enjoy long-haired music, as we called it. You know, those slow songs. But I learned to enjoy Christian music. Uh, I had learned songs that were hymns in our church that I grew up in. I did not hear the gospel in my church, sorry to say. It wasn't until I was 21 years of age that I went to a meeting and heard about Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. And in the 1970s and 1980s, I started to learn to appreciate Christian music. WLS was off my chart. All those things that were music inputs in my life were all off my chart. I started to listen to God's music. Music and songs changed my attitude. It changed the way I thought. It challenged me. At times it encouraged me. At times I needed God so deeply and desperately I was depressed, down in the dumps for some reason, and music cheered me up. Music has been an important part of my life. Those messages and those songs made an impact, and it has not changed. This morning I woke up, this morning, and it was an old hymn. I don't know the last time I heard this hymn. And I was singing it. My wife says, I really love that song. I don't know what it was because uh, time has passed from the time I was singing until I got here. But I'll tell you, at that moment, it was ministering to me. It was speaking to me. It was touching my heart because of the message of that song. And it continues, and it will continue in my life. The good old days, yeah. I'm not sure they were so good, but that's where it's at. But what about you? What about music in your life? What part does music play in your life? Some of you listen to it all the time. You got earbuds, you know? You plop them in, you get the warning signs. Don't play it so loud. You're going to lose your hearing. You'll have hearing aids like Pastor Les. Yeah, it will happen. I hear people that are 39, 40 years old saying, you know, I'm losing my hearing. I said, well, Better look back at your history of your life, see what happened in order to get to that point. What about music in your life? 
Do you enjoy Christian music? Or do you enjoy worldly music more? Now, I'm not saying, and I want you to understand this morning, I'm not here bashing music. I want you to understand there's good music and there's less approved music on my charts. There are some things that uh, I have gone to concerts because my wife enjoys that kind of music. I don't, but I go anyway. And I do the best I can to enjoy it. Not that it's evil, it's not. It's just styles, you know. I won't tell you what kind. <laughs> She's going to go with me on the 15th of this month to hear the Gettys. And because I want to go, and I appreciate the Gettys, and so I'm going to go to Elmbrook Church to, to do that. Which would you prefer to hear? Jingle Bells or Silent Night? You'd probably say neither one, but maybe you're more contemporary about which song you choose at Christmas. I've heard Jingle Bells at least 4,728 <laughs> times in my life. <laughs> and if I never heard Jingle Bells again and a lot of other of the normal songs, I would be just fine. Uh, if you get any Christmas songs during the Christmas season like now, it's because my secretary or Carissa choose them and not me because I'm too biased. I probably would not choose them but I enjoy them when I sing them and the messages they speak to my heart, I appreciate them. But are they on the top 10 of mine? No, probably not. That's okay. So we're all different and we all look at it. Does music draw you closer to God is the question I want to give to you this morning. Because that's what music needs to be doing in your life. And if you're listening to worldly music, we're going to miss the boat. I want you to take a trip with me. The year is approximately 1450 BC. The people of Israel have crossed the Red Sea. We're going to look at a chapter in this particular book of Exodus. And by the way, if you don't have your Bible, there's one in front of you on the chair. You can follow with us. It's called the Song of Moses in my book. They've entitled it that. It's a song. It's music for the Israelite people. I want you to go to the previous chapter, chapter 14, starting with verse 29 to pick up the backdrop of this. It says from verses 26 on how God stretched his hand out, how that the people of Israel crossed on dry ground. It says in verse 29, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. God had performed an awesome miracle in the lives of the Israelites. He had taken and allowed them to walk across a sea. I, I, I want you to imagine, if you could, with me, that the sides of the water on the right hand and on the left one were probably as high as the ceiling and maybe even as high as a half a mile. I mean, like way up. And they were walking on dry ground 
of this Red Sea, probably about a half a mile across, two million people are going to cross this area and they're looking. I'm sure the kids, <laughs> if I was a kid, I would have. I'd have picked up a rock and threw it in the water. <laughs> It'd splash out. And the kids, probably all the Israeli kids, were running around picking up stones and throwing them into the water, having a good time. And the adults, I mean, they were a little bit trepid about doing this thing, going in the water like this and seeing the water on both sides saying, when is it coming down? But you know, they passed all the way over, nine miles approximately across the Red Sea at this point in time. And the Bible says that the Lord saved Israel. The whole nation was saved, taken out of the hand of Pharaoh and the armies that were coming. They had 900 chariots. They had an army that was going to sweep down, and they didn't have the ability to fight against them. But the Egyptians didn't think about it. They had 10 plagues that God had performed in Egypt, and here they come again trying to get the people of Israel. And of course, God's power, his power was unleashed. Wouldn't you like to have been one of those Israelites crossing the Red Sea? Huh? Oh, some of you are a little bit hesitant. I know can see that. Give you the verse in Scripture as... Uh, related to that increase of faith that comes. Psalm chapter 7, verse 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. This psalm tells me that we as Christians need to be giving thanks and we need to be singing praise to him. Now, when I was listening to Elvis Presley and the Beatles, there was none of that going around too much. Yeah, he had a gospel album. I understand that. Elvis did. I used to listen to it. I won't tell you the story about that. But... We bought some records and everything else about, again, music that helped us to be able to learn about God and be edified and encouraged, but singing praise. And this is what the Israelites are doing here in this particular chapter. And when I first started to study for this, I said, oh, Lord. But you know, the more I got into it, the more I enjoyed what God was trying to tell me personally, and I hope this morning you'll catch what God is trying to tell us as Christians in 2019. My theme this morning is basically this, godly songs and music in the Christian life should accomplish two main goals. And I hope on the back of your bulletin, if you want to take some notes, you're welcome to do that to focus on that. And the first goal is to focus on our God. I believe the reason why we have music available to us, I, there are so many songs that I say, I really like that one, I really like that one. I really, there was a song that I just heard probably only 10 times, but the power of that song really gripped my heart, really touched me, really moved me to understand the power of God. It went on for 10 minutes, and I replayed it again, and I replayed it again. Why? Because it was striking the chord of my heart about the power of God, about the name of Christ, and how the name of Jesus is so powerful. I want you to Come with me. Let's get into this passage of Scripture and let's learn about the God that we have. Verse 1, chapter 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I want to stop right there. 
you, you sang this morning. Some of you may not have, that's okay. But you know, most of you sang this morning. My question is, to whom were you singing? The Israelites were singing to the Lord. You know, they just got out of that dry bed where the water was, and God poured the water on top of the Egyptians. They got out of that predicament. They got out of being killed and captivated by those Egyptians. They were praising. I mean, they, they, were, they were jumping up and down for joy. They were elated about what God did in that moment of time when they saw the waters come crashing down on those Egyptians. You see, they saw the hand of God in their life. Are you seeing the hand of God in your life? Are you seeing God working in your life? Are you seeing God doing things that are exciting and thrilling in your life? Until you start to see that, you are not going to be excited and thrilled about worshiping God and praising Him. Your songs will go up, but they hit the ceiling and bounce back down at you. We need to have music that is going to thrill us and excite us and help motivate us to get to know God better in our lives. And if you don't listen to Christian music, you listen to world music all the time, you're not going to have that ability, not going to enjoy that part of life. Notice what it says in verse 1 yet. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Ho oh, ho! We're saved! Man, look at those horses. Look at them float. Look at those dead bodies of the Egyptians floating. I mean, we spent all night coming across the sea. We spent all morning going across the sea. All two million people were saved. All of our flocks were saved. Everything that we had materially were saved. And they thought they were going to beat us and get us. And we're saved. And God did it. Verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God. I will exalt him. I want you to notice the pronouns. This is my strength. This is my song. This is my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. I will exalt him. Get involved in music. We sang five songs, six songs this morning. Were you involved in it? Were, 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 was it coming from your heart? Or just lipping the words because you know the song and everybody else is singing it, so I'll sing it too. My song, my God, my Savior, my Deliverer, it's about me and Him. I want you to understand when you die, you will stand before him all by yourself. Nobody will be around you. You'll be naked, not physically. You'll be naked before him. He's going to expose every part of your life. Now, this is not a game. It's not religion. It's the real thing because it comes from the real book. The only book, the Word, the Bible. Do you have a personal relationship with a personal God? Or is he just something out there? And on Sunday morning, you grab your Bible, you come to church, and you sit here, and you listen to the preacher, and you go back home, put the Bible back on the shelf, and then you wait till next Sunday. Hmm? You can do that. You have the privilege. Notice what they said in verse 3. They sang. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Oh, I thought God was a God of love. 
Hmm? He's a man of war. One of these days, he's going to fight. The second coming of Christ, I don't want to be around. I won't be around. <laughs> I'm glad for that. But if you don't have any hope, you may face that. If you don't have Christ as your Savior, you will face that if you live through the Great Tribulation. The Lord is the man of war. The Lord is his name. He fights for me. He fights for you if you're a Christian. It's a wonderful thing. We don't have to put up our dukes. We don't have to take our guns and knives out. God is the one who fights for us. Probably has fought many battles. You didn't even know it. Verses 4 through 8. God's great power in his protection. Verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed the heart and the sea. This is the song they sang. They were excited. They were thrilled about what God was doing. God's great power. Exalting his power, seeing his power, manifesting his power and the protection that he gave. And God's always there. And that mighty foe that came against them was no longer there. The enemy was gone. I was talking to a woman some time ago, a mother, about raising her kids. And just to show you how the enemy works in our lives many times, is one of her children told her, as they were talking about music, now get this, the daughter is five years old, and she says to her mom, my favorite song is You Don't Own Me by Leslie Gore. And the mother said it became the theme of her life at that point as a grown up. Don't tell me music doesn't impact kids. Don't tell me that your children or your grandkids that are listening to some music on their earbuds and you don't know what they're listening to. It's invading their minds. It's invading the way they think, their attitudes, and what they do. I saw it happening with my kids. You know what? We did everything we could to stop or bridge that area. I remember one time we were in our living room, and, and the boys wanted, said, Mom, can we uh, play this CD? And then I said, well, we're going to have a meeting this evening and a devotional time, and we'll play the songs. We'll see what they say, and uh, we'll, we'll get together. And after we listened, we said, no, you're not going to listen to that. And we took away the CDs. Well, they, they found other avenues. You know how kids are. And they found their own ways to do what they wanted to do. And uh, by the time they get to be 18, you could hear the cars shaking as they went down the street. The thump, 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 you know, whatever they put in the back end. I mean, they had some powerful stuff there. I think the whole car shook apart. Yeah. There was power, but it wasn't in God's power. It was power of the music, how loud it was. Yeah, but the devil uses music for himself as well. Our enemy is, is using the music to penetrate into our culture, into our society. And people that you will come to know eventually will find that to be true. Well, the God of great power, 
Verse 9. And the enemy said, I will pursue and overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its full of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. That was Pharaoh. That was the Egyptian army. We're going to get these Israelites. We're going to go after them. We're going to get them. His pride, his arrogance. I'm tough. They're nothing. They've been our slaves for decades, and we're going to bring them back, and we're going to make them their, our slaves again. They were assured of that. But notice verse 10. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. I love verse 11. Verse 11 just pumps me up. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? I asked you the question. Who is like our God, the God of the Bible? Jehovah, if you wish. Jesus, if you wish. It doesn't matter which name you want to attach or what title you want to attach to our God. He is the only God. He is the creator God. He made this world in six days. Didn't come by evolution. Did not come by any other source. It came from the hand of our God. There is no one like him. No one. You will find out one day that there was no one like him. Whether you accept it or not, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. It's not up to you to make that decision. Our God is sovereign. He will come. He will do his will. Just as much as he did it to Pharaoh, he did it to his armies. He destroyed them all just by the wind and allowed the waters to come down and crush them all. I love it. I love it. Verses 12 and 13, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You led them in your steadfast love and the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. This is their song. They're singing their song over and over and over again after they left the Red Sea. They're going to sing this song as long as they can remember. Why? Because it's a personal God with people who have a personal relationship with him. How about you? I like singing in my shower. I like singing in my car, my van. I used to go to pastor's conference and I'd have a song on and I'd just sing it for mile after mile after mile. I love getting up in the morning, waking up and singing a song, a new one. I didn't, oh, where'd that come from? came from my God who has burrowed it into my heart. I love singing on Sundays. When I came to Grace Bible Church, it was what they call three and out. You know what three and out is? You have three hymns and then the preacher gets up and he does the real thing. No, no, it's the worship that is the real thing. I just get up and I put the cake frosting on, I hope, or something. But it's the singing, it's the, it's the intimacy that we get, the relationship that we build with God in singing that's so important. I spend time listening to my worth is not in what I own. Just the other night, my spirit was lifted up. Yeah. What I have is nothing, God, but you are everything to me. And I talked to my Lord, and I just shared with him my heart. I love this song. This is Amazing Grace by Phil Wickman. I love us singing when we hear it. I wish we could sing it this Sunday. I, like, I wish we could sing it every Sunday. It says here, it's Amazing Grace, Amazing Love, that would take my place, that he would bear my life, his life, he laid down his life. He set me free. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. 
unfailing love. You lay down your life. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus Christ did so much for me. Forever, forever, I will praise him and thank him and worship him because he's my God. If he's not your God, I feel sorry for you. But he's my God. And there's no reason to feel sorry for me. If I should die, don't feel sorry for me. Maybe my wife, but not me. She'll be coming after me in a little while. What part does music have in your life? Shower, car, van, driving, long distances, waking up in the morning, music that thrills your heart. Is it Christian music? Is it godly music that really speaks to you? It's not about your voice when we come to church. It's not about the words that you know them all or don't know them all. It's not about the right notes. I'm telling you this morning, I hit some wrong notes again. In fact, they don't want to put a mic on me. Sometimes they have it on. They shouldn't be, but uh, it gets started, and I don't even know it. I just bellow it out, and, you know, if you're listening, you'll hear the wrong notes and everything else. I just so appreciate a worship team that's able to help me and guide me in my worship of my God and not be concerned about my own notes and my own words I mean, some, some of these songs, I mean, they're just not synchronized right. I don't know, but that's okay. Psalm 100 verse 1 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, and I do that real well. And God wants us to do that. Psalm 100, and here's some other psalms, by the way, that you may want to look up later and talks about singing, talks about worship. These passages of scripture are so important that you might be able to take and, and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Music about our God. Music that exalts him and lifts him up. We're going to get to the second goal real quick, goal real quickly here, and that is to give us hope. Music gives us hope. Music gave the Israelites hope. Look at what it says here. We're going to start with verse 14. The peoples have heard, that is the Gentile peoples of the world, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. What they're seeing is that these nations around us are all scared of us. They're afraid because our God did it. What they did in the Red Sea. Do you remember 40 years from now, the Israelite people are going to be at the very edge of getting into Canaan land. And they're getting themselves prepared for that journey across the Jordan River. And Joshua sends out two spies and he says, I want you to go out and check out these Canaanites and see what's happening here. They're ready to go on and, and attack Jericho. And so they go to Jericho. These two spies sort of sneak in to the front gate, and they get inside of the city, and they end up at this place, probably a, a place of uh, a restaurant, and there's rooms for rent probably at Rahab's place. Rahab's a harlot. They don't know it yet. And in talking with Rahab, they're, they're, they're talking about, and pretty soon you can hear down the street, there's some loud shouting, there's some loud words. You know, they're after some men that have come in. They're Israelites. The gates have been closed. And so Rahab says to the two spies, she says, let me take you upstairs. I've got some flax being dried out upstairs, and I want you to, to lay underneath this flax. I'm going to lay it out over the top of you because they're going to come here. They're going to check this place out. They're going to look for you. And I just want you to know I'm not going to tell them that you're here. And so the, the soldiers come in from Jericho, and they check out the building, they, and, and they leave the building. And she says this, you know, 
our whole city is trembling because you're on the other side of the Jordan River and we know that you're going to come over because we have heard years and years ago that the Red Sea was opened by, by your God, that the Red Sea came down crashing on Pharaoh and his soldiers and wiped them all out. We've heard that and we're scared to death. All our hearts are melting because of what we've heard. And you know the rest of the story, don't you? But that's the thing. These nations were afraid. It says here in verse 16, terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm, God. They are still as stone. I mean, they don't know what to do. They're standing still till your people, O oh Lord, pass by. They're just hoping they're not in their path. They were afraid. They were concerned. It says in verse 17, Mixing me, I'll, I'll finish up verse 16. Till the people have passed by whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, Jerusalem. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. I love verse 18. The Lord will reign forever and ever. That's all. Not talking about just tomorrow, next week, next month. He's talking about eternity. Our God is concerned about us, and he's concerned about our eternal destiny. If you were to die today, would you be 100% sure you'd go to heaven? 100%? You say, yes, pastor. I say, if we were to stand before God and he were to ask you and say, God says, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? Would you tell him, well, I'm a pretty good person. I went to church every Sunday, read my Bible, I prayed. None of that would help. There's only one thing that we need to do, and that's to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus came for the very purpose of dying on the cross for us that we might have eternal life. I hope that you have that hope inside of you, the eternal hope that only God gives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yeah. Joshua 2. Fear melting away because of the Red Sea experience. God's blessings. I love the blessings of God. And God blessed them in a very special way. I love the song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, all fear is gone when I die because I know where I'm going. Not because I'm a good person, not because I'm a preacher, not because I, I, I have the cloth, if you want to call it around me. It's because Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for my sins just as much as he paid the price for your sins. And in paying the price for your sins, when you trust him as Savior, it's a clean deal forever and ever and ever. No end. The women join in the song. In verse 19, it says, the miracle. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam and the prophetess and sisters of Aaron took a tambourine in her hand. And all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Victory. I love songs like, Lord, I need you. I need you every hour. I need you every day. I need you right now. 
I like a song like Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. I love the song, The Wonderful Cross, and I could go on and on and on. So why do you sing? Hopefully it gives you joy. Hopefully that you are rejoicing because of what you are singing about. Gives you hope and encouragement sometimes. And we need that in our lives. I do. And sometimes it builds you up in time of need. Songs. Many songs that God has given to us. We've got a new song at Grace Bible Church called Build My Life. I'm learning this song. I hope to be able to sing it one day when I get in the shower or get up in the morning. And I hope that you will be able to enjoy the song this morning if you don't know it. And if you know it, you can blast it out, okay? Sing it loudly from your heart. It's called Build My Life. Let's stand. Let's worship him. <laughs>